Vinyan clenches his teeth, struggling to comprehend how things have turned this way. Rain's dark presence fills the air as he moves closer, his aura wrapping around Vinyan like a suffocating fog. Fear takes hold of Vinyan as the oppressive energy makes it hard for him to breathe, his mind spinning in panic. The scene shifts to a carriage speeding down a broad road. Inside, Cage smirks with a menacing glint in her eye, while Vinyan's disoriented face hangs upside down as Choi Han casually carries him on his shoulder. Cage exchanges a look with Kale, who is focused on the unconscious bodies of Vinyan's subordinates, preparing to deal with them swiftly as time is short. Cage offers a reminder of the upcoming important date, prompting Kale to respond with quiet confidence. He knows it will be a long, grueling day, one that will feel as if it stretches for an eternity. There's no way he'll be able to forget it, even if he wanted to. The carriage arrives at its destination, pulling up to a gate. A hooded man at the reins brings it to a stop, and Kale offers him a brief word of thanks before dismissing him. As the man walks away, he reflects on how he had misjudged Kale, realizing that the young master's kind reputation doesn't fully capture his depth. Choi Han's loyalty and righteous nature stand out, as does the fact that even he himself follows Kale's commands without hesitation. Flynn too comes to understand why he was entrusted with personally handling Vinyan Sten. This situation is far beyond what his subordinates could manage. He realizes just how critical this task truly is. As Kale walks into the building, Vicros is already there, waiting. Without wasting any time, they both head into a room that looks more like a torture chamber. Choi Han still has Vinyan slung over his shoulder, and Rayon can't help but comment on how the room looks similar. Kale's mind wanders for a second, remembering how he had already told Vicross about Rayon, the dragon. Rayon was the one who got their food while they traveled after leaving the capital. But now, since Vicross doesn't know the whole story behind Vinyan, things feel a bit off. Choi Han drops Vinyan into a chair, and Vicross, being his usual self, asks if they should move forward with the plan. Kale gives him the go-ahead. Vicross, still unsure, asks for clarification, and that's when Rayan, clearly pissed, starts venting. He talks about the years he spent being threatened, tortured, and abused while trapped in the cave. Rayan vows to repay every bit of suffering he endured over the next four days, giving a glimpse of the horrible things he went through. He starts by mentioning how he was whipped until his skin peeled and how they just keep hitting the open wounds. Kale, unable to hold back his anger, kicks the chair Vinyan is sitting in. Vinyan's still out cold from the hypnotoxin, and Kale notes how strong it is. He quickly apologizes to Ran for the interruption and steps aside, letting Ran continue. With time being short, Ran sticks to the main points, but his message is clear. Watching all this, Kale smirks a little. As expected, Vicross, the professional torturer, gets rattled when it comes to the young. He clenches his fists, clearly angry, but before anything else can happen, Kale casually asks him to cook. Surprised, Vicross asks if he means right now, in the middle of this torture room. Kale grins and confirms, explaining that Ran needs to eat. Ran adds his own bit, recalling how Vinyan would beat him while saying it helped his appetite. Apparently, he ate better while watching Ran bleed. Hearing that, Han grits his teeth in frustration. Vicross, slipping on his gloves with a darker tone, mutters that he'll cook up something grand, fully ready to make it count. Vinyan stirs awake, grunting softly as a wave of terror washes over him. His mind races, trying to piece together his surroundings. He remembers that dragon, Ran, and the chilling words Ran spoke, now echoing in his head. He starts to panic, realizing where he is, furious at the thought of being dragged to such a grimy place. As he tries to speak, only a hoarse grunt escapes, his voice barely functioning. He turns his head, catching sight of something on the table. Food. The pain hits him again as he wonders why he can't talk. Fear floods his senses as he spots Vicros approaching. Vicros stands by while Ran, seated at the table with Kale, gives the signal to start. Vinyan's screams soon fill the room, his blood splattering as Vicros begins his torturous work. Ran watches with a deep-seated hatred, his mind flashing back to Vinyan's cruel face and the torment he endured. The memory of Vinyan's commands, telling him to stay silent and still, plays in his head. Now, Ran scoffs at the sight of Vinyan in agony, taking a handful of food and shoving it into his mouth. On and Hong, watching the scene unfold, tremble with fear. 
Hong averts his eyes, unable to bear it, while An braces herself, forces herself to keep watching. She insists she must. Kale, observing them, can sense how difficult it is for them. It's not just the cruelty of the scene or Vinyan's pitiful state. They understand this is only the beginning, knowing all too well what Ran endured. Kale gently pats An's head, reassuring her that she doesn't need to watch. He glances at Ran, who has closed his eyes, visibly pained despite continuing to eat. Vinyan's screams grow louder as Vicarus mercilessly beats him with chains. Rain's mind is filled with memories of the times Vinyan killed him, tears streaming down his face. Yet he continues to eat, trying to ignore his emotions. Kale watches him, concerned, and comments on Rand's overeating, handing him a napkin to wipe his mouth. Kale then turns his attention to Vicross, asking why he's using a potion. Vicross, ever practical, explains he's just treating Vinyan, but Kale reminds him to hold off until he is at the brink of death. Vicross agrees, saying it's a fitting order. Kale then picks Ran up, holding him close in his lap. He notices that, though Ran hasn't physically changed in size, he's gained a bit of weight over the past few months. Standing up with Ran in his arms, Kale tells Vicross it's time for a break. He kicks Vinyan, casually asking what they should do once he wakes up. Ran responds with frustration, reminding him that they're going to continue. Vicross nods in understanding. Meanwhile, Kale knocks on a door, which Choi Han opens, looking at Ran in surprise. Kale tells him there's new wine inside and asks him to bring it along with the glasses. Choi Han agrees while Kale walks away, joking with Ran about how much heavier he feels. Ran retorts that it's not him growing, but Kale getting weaker. He just sighs, admitting he has no comeback for that, though he acknowledges it's good to see Ran getting bigger and growing up well. Ran, still thinking about Vinyan, decides internally that he'll let Vinyan live, but plans to come for him whenever he loses his appetite. Vinyan suddenly wakes up screaming, shocked by how he feels no pain and that his voice has returned to normal. He's confused, wondering if everything that just happened was a dream. He tries to shake off the fear and sits down casually laughing to himself, trying to convince himself it was all just in his head. However, the terror he felt over the past four days was real, and it had shaken his arrogance to the core. Vicarus had instilled so much fear in Vinyan that he lost his grip on reality at times. There was no need to bring in further mental torture. It was clear Vinyan was already broken. As he reflects on Ran's words about letting him live but coming for him whenever Ran loses his appetite, Vinyan clenches his fists, cursing Ran under his breath. Panic sets in as he rushes toward the door. Just as he's about to escape, someone steps in front of him. Vinyan freezes, recognizing the person immediately, Taylor Sten. Terrified, Vinyan stutters, unsure if this is still part of the nightmare. Taylor, however, calmly orders his men to arrest Vinyan. The scene transitions to Ran and the kittens munching on food with Han feeding them. They seem relaxed, enjoying the moment when Taylor's pleased voice fills the air, noting how Kale finally has some time to meet with him. Taylor mentions that if not today, Kale will likely get busier soon. He and Taylor sit across from each other at the table, and Kale nods in agreement. Taylor brings up how most of the people Kale told him about were connected to Vinyan, and that a few even worked for his father. Kale hums in response, deep in thought, realizing Taylor is likely putting on an act. Under the Marky orders, Vinyan had raised the Black Dragon, and there were people guarding that place for him. Kale knows those involved will face severe punishment, ranging from hard labor to the death penalty. The Sten family's laws are harsh. Meanwhile, Vinyan sits in a dark room mumbling to himself about the dragon clearly still shaken. Kale thinks about how the Marquis will need to clean up all loose ends to escape this situation. Taylor smirking interrupts Kale's thoughts, claiming he believes him. Cage, picking up a bottle of wine, cheerfully suggests they stop talking about serious matters and focus on enjoying the drink instead. Both men smile and agree sharing a drink together. Taylor then tells Kale that he will definitely repay him for everything, to which Kale responds with a knowing nod, looking forward to it. Taylor pours them both drinks, and the mood lightens. The next day, Kale is standing with Flynn outside a castle, with some carriages ready. Flynn tells him that the request proceeded smoothly and was satisfactory. Flynn adds that the payment was more than generous, which made it a great deal for him. Kale gets into the carriage, casually mentioning that he'll get in touch again. 
Flynn responds with a polite acknowledgement but thinks to himself that while working with Kale is dangerous and difficult, he knows he'll end up seeing him again. Kale smirks, asking if Flynn knows the basement. Flynn hesitates but assures him that everything will be cleaned up perfectly. Internally, Flynn curses at Kale's reputation, knowing that the kind and self-sacrificing young master doesn't exist here. Kale is anything but that. He's cruel and cunning. He reminds Flynn not to tell Billows about what happened, stressing the importance of secrecy with his requests. Flynn nods, and with that, Kale settles inside the carriage. As it takes off, Flynn bows, bidding him goodbye with a thoughtful expression. The carriage continues its journey through the Rocky Mountains. Inside, Choi Han asks the kittens if they find it boring. They respond with excitement, declaring that it's not boring at all and that they enjoy lounging around. Choi Han chuckles, noting that they really take after Kale. Hearing this, Kale wonders if Han is making fun of him or if it's meant as a compliment. Han mentions that they've been here before, referring to it as basically a stone pit. Kale processes this information, surprised to learn that Choi Han has traveled through this area before. He asked if Choi Han came here during his visit to the Breck Kingdom and if he caused any trouble there. Han assures him he didn't. Kale thinks that hearing about the outcome of the Breck Kingdom from the Crown Prince is enough for him. Kale then inquires if Choi Han passed the Ten Peak Mountains while traveling through the West Region. He doesn't recall such a mountain and asks if it really exists. Kale explains that it marks the starting point of the southwestern part of the Ron Kingdom, featuring ten granite peaks that resemble fingers. Choi Han states that he doesn't think they saw the mountains as they headed northwest and used the same route on their return. He believes he would have remembered if he had seen them. Kale finds the scenery mysterious and expresses his curiosity. He shares that he's thinking about going to the Ten Peaks a year later. Choi Han looks confused by the mention of a year later. Kale nods, thinking to himself that they must go to the Ten Peaks exactly one year from now, knowing that the last ancient power will reveal itself there. Kale suggests that traveling together would be a great idea. The kittens, excited by the thought, eagerly respond with enthusiasm. Choi Han, however, brings up a concern, pointing out that the Ten Peaks likely doesn't have any nearby villages where they could stay. Kale initially dismisses the idea, then pauses, realizing Choi Han is right. No villages exist in that area. Reflecting on the absence of human settlements, he recalls that while no human villages exist near the Ten Peaks, there is an elven village hidden with illusion magic. Elves, mysterious and nature-loving, live in harmony with nature and worship dragons more than mages. As one of the few races compatible with nature and capable of controlling spirits, their beauty and mystique always captivated the people of the continent. Kale remembers that in the original timeline when Choi Han returned from the Breck Kingdom, he stumbled upon this hidden elven village and met Pendrick, an elf who can heal others. Pendrick's life ultimately saved Lark during a dangerous frenzy, though it cost him his own life. In this altered timeline, however, if Choi Han doesn't meet Pendrick, the elf might be spared his tragic fate. Kale considers that the biggest deviation from the original birth of the hero story could be this. Pendrick living longer. They have already missed the time to meet him, so if they go to the Ten Peaks now, they could avoid the elven village altogether. With this thought in mind, Kale snaps back to reality and agrees that there isn't a village around. Ran, however, isn't bothered by this and expresses his eagerness to visit quickly. Kale acknowledges that bringing Rayant to the elven village could complicate things since they might revere him as a god. Patting Rayant on the head, he shifts the conversation, focusing on something else, the crown prince's magic. As Kale presents a gift to the crown prince, the prince initially seems confused. However, after opening the bottle, the prince immediately recognizes the familiar smell of the black swamp. Kale, ever the strategist, thinks back to the rumors about the Ran Kingdom's crown prince, known for his ordinary brown hair. Ran had once questioned why the prince dyed his hair with magic, but Kale now wonders whether the prince could even alter his appearance without using mana. Pondering the nature of the prince's power, Kale considers all the possibilities. Dragons, humans, cats, wolves, and other species, all possessing unique abilities, he still can't quite figure out what the crown prince's power is, but the answer seems to lie within the glass bottle he holds. The prince isn't a demon, nor does he use dark magic or necromancy. Bringing himself back to the present, 
Kale mentions a misunderstanding about the Lake King's southern bloodline, linking it to dark elves, who typically have darker skin tones. However, he notes that half-bloods resemble those from the south, subtly suggesting that the prince might be the child of a half-blooded dark elf. The prince's reaction, a scoff of acknowledgement, confirms Kale's suspicions. Smiling to himself, he knows he was right all along. Kale reflects on the dark elves and their history with the darkness attribute. Their power comes from the mana of the dead, a connection that led them to be reviled. In the past, they were associated with graveyards and villages plagued by disease, earning them the hatred of the people. This forced them into hiding even more than the elves themselves. The crown prince places the bottle down, its significance not lost on either of them. Kale contemplates his intent. This isn't a gift without strings attached. He wants to make the prince work for something in return. Meanwhile, the prince sees the situation clearly. Kale could have taken this information to rival princes, but he's choosing to strike a deal instead. This similarity to his own calculated mindset pleases the prince. Though he's surprised by Kale's insight into his identity as a dark elf, it's a secret only known to his closest family members, so the fact that Kale knows unsettles him. Rayan reassures Kale in his quiet way, a reminder that the dragon's support remains steadfast. Kale, however, stays focused on the potion and its importance. The prince understands. This rare item will strengthen him, its value immense, especially considering it contains the mana of a dead dragon, something almost impossible to acquire. With this, the prince knows he can elevate his strength through several stages. But the deeper motives run through Kale's mind. The Rain Kingdom is one of the weakest right now, especially when compared to the other kingdoms. With the Whipper Kingdom in Desiree and Northern forces preparing for movement, Kale knows Albert is bolstering his own forces, but it won't be enough. The looming threat of the Empire and the Wyvern Knights in the skies puts additional pressure on them. The kingdom needs a strong ruler, someone who can withstand the coming storm. For his own survival, the Rand Kingdom must emerge stronger from the war. Kale understands that turning what could be a dangerous force into an ally is the best course of action. Kale inquires about the prince's connection to the Magic Tower, curious about its relevance. The prince, acknowledging Kale's awareness of many things, admits that the Magic Tower master provided had been quite useful. Through this, he had been able to send his message to the remaining mages, with the future ruler of the Land of Stone promising them protection. Reflecting on his plans, the prince had intended to move the Rand Kingdom to the Magic Tower and restore it. The prince finds it difficult to issue commands to Kale, realizing that a request might be more appropriate. He clarifies that he has no intention of fully restoring the Magic Tower, but he is willing to provide part of the blueprint. When asked about the condition, Kale expresses that he wants the agreement to come into effect in two years, aligning with his goal for a peaceful, safe, and unemployed life. In addition to wealth, he seeks hegemony, believing that the best part of unemployment is not having to deal with clients or superiors. Although he had planned to live a carefree, unemployed life, he can't do so while constantly being cautious of others. He's ready to embrace his desires and live on his own terms. The prince, confused, presses Kale on his cryptic statements, but he simply replies that it's up to the prince to decide. The prince, nervous but intrigued, realizes he's the one profiting from this deal, though it leaves him feeling unsettled. Kale reassures him that it's a win-win situation for both of them and urges the prince to enjoy himself. Internally, Kale remains uncertain of the prince's thoughts. As he stands to leave, the prince permits him to go, recognizing that Kale likely won't give him any more answers anyway. A few days later in Henatu's territory, Kale had hoped for some rest, but something seems to have happened again. Han stands in front of him, clearly nervous. Kale urges him to speak quickly, and Hans delivers the news. Ron has returned, but his condition is not good. The information shocks everyone, and they rush to where Ron is resting. Vikros runs ahead, shouting for his father, while Kale follows closely behind. Upon entering the room, he immediately notices Ron lying on the bed, covered in bandages with his arm severed. He questions Ron about his arm, to which he calmly replies that circumstances led to this outcome. Kale's demeanor shifts, becoming more serious as he instructs Hans to leave the room. He then tells Vikros and Choi Han to stay, while the others, including An and Hong, quietly exit. Though the kittens remain concerned, kneeling beside the bed, Vikros stays close to his father, 
while Kale asks if Ron has the strength to speak. Ron, still composed despite his injuries, assures Kale that he does. Kale demands to know what happened, wondering how someone who merely went fox hunting could return in such a state. Vicros calls out to his father again, his voice filled with worry. Ron, watching him, thinks he shouldn't have come here. He knows he's going to die anyway, but before that, he just wanted to see his son and a few others one last time. Ron starts explaining his past. He came from the eastern continent when Beecrox was very young. As an assassin, he was once the heir to one of the five famous assassin families in the underground world. His family, however, fell due to an organization called Darkness. At first, Darkness seemed like a low-ranking group running the underground, but after digging deeper, Ron realized someone more powerful was pulling the strings. Unable to find out who it was, he fled to the southern western continent with his son, hiding and living as an attendant. Everything changed when Choi Han arrived at the castle. For the first time in years, Ron caught the scent of darkness again. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to someone struggling with worsening illness, thinking about the need to gather medicinal herbs. Han, standing beside him, offers to go to the forest of darkness. Though the man expresses concern over the dangers of the forest, Choi Han reassures him that he'll be fine and heads out. The scene shifts again, this time to Han, frozen in shock, blood splattered across his face as he stands among the bodies of the dead. Back in the present, Choi Han questions Ron, making a connection to Harris Village. Kale, reflecting on past events, thinks about the string of incidents. Harris Village, Ron, at the Marquis Palace, the terrorist attack on the Capitol Square, the ambush on the Blue Wolf Tribe. He begins to piece together that the same group could be behind all of these events. Ron continues, explaining how darkness had started to gain power in the western continent. He had decided to use the opportunity to make his move, but it turned out to be much more dangerous than he anticipated, like a stray dog wandering into a lion's den. Despite the risks, Ron has no regrets, knowing he needed to uncover their plans. While investigating in the capital, Ron encountered one of darkness's attack forces and learned a bit about their activities. However, he lost his left arm in the battle at the square and barely escaped with his life. Disappointed, he admits he couldn't fully uncover what darkness is. Kale asks if Ron remembers who cut his arm off, and Ron reveals it was a young mage, one who made a habit of severing the limbs of anyone he came across. Hearing Ron's revelation, Kale immediately thinks of Redica, cursing him under his breath. Choi Han grits his teeth in frustration, desperate to understand how this happened. Kale contemplates how Ron is stronger than Redica, skilled in assassination and stealth, and wonders why he was forced to escape after losing his left arm. He asks Ron about the rotten smell lingering in the air. With a slight movement, Ron reveals the bandages covering his stomach and legs, shocking both Vicross and Kale as they see the darkened wounds on his legs. Ron explains he was poisoned with mermaid poison. Kale sighs, realizing that the ones the mermaids were helping must be connected to this situation. Internally, he thinks back to when he first met the whales and their talk of the forest of darkness, connecting it to the mermaids growing stronger from materials found there. He had suspected this all along but didn't want to delve deeper, knowing it would only complicate matters. But he recognizes that if he uncovers the truth about this organization, he needs to inform Choi Han. Kale acknowledges that his safety isn't the only concern here. No one should be able to infiltrate his territory. He curses under his breath, feeling uneasy about the wicked old man Ron but realizing he's one of his own. Coming out of his thoughts, he'd asked Ron if it happened by the sea to which Ron replies it was on an island. Kale quickly calls out to Choi Han, ordering him to stop overthinking and get the blueprints for the ship right away. He insists that Ron will be coming with him, determined to take action if his assassin returns injured. Ron reassures him he's still alive, prompting Kale to smirk, recalling Ron's letter and how he always has a smart mouth. Turning to Vicross, Kale commands him to tell the party to pack everything again, emphasizing the need to neutralize the mermaid poison. Vicross stutters in shock, questioning if there's a way to do that. Kale thinks about a method he previously used to save a half-blooded whale, telling Vicross not to worry and to prepare. He adds that Ron looks like he'll have a long life ahead. Once everyone else leaves, Ron turns to Kale, sharing his belief that Darkness and the mermaids are after the sea routes. Kale nods in agreement, which confuses Ron. Kale asks if anyone has seen Ron's face, 
to which he admits only the mage has. Ron expresses concern that Kale isn't planning to confront the organization directly. He playfully asks what Ron thinks, and Ron smirks, reassuring him that whatever happens will turn out fine and will benefit Kale. As expected, Kale thinks to himself that Ron knows him too well. He had no intention of creating a troublesome burden. Instead, he plans to achieve his goal swiftly and retreat, all while scheming a way to stab them in the back. Kale tells Ron to rest well until they leave, and Ron nods. Outside, Kale finds the dragon waiting for him, who assures him not to worry because he's with the Great Ran. Kale's thoughts drift to the strength of their enemies, whether it's the secret organization Darkness or the Mermaids, acknowledging that fighting them head-on would be difficult. He knows the Black Dragon, Choi Han, and Rosalind are aware of who's around him and their capabilities. Kale has a plan in place to protect those living near the border and himself, ensuring both his physical and mental comfort. A few days later, in Nugra territory, Kale stands at a construction site. A man greets him, taking on the formalities with ease, introducing himself as the one responsible for the naval base construction. The recent clearing of several whirlpools has opened up more islands, allowing for accelerated development along the coast. The result? Ships being built faster than anticipated, aided by the now stabilized waters. Instead of heading to lodgings first, Kale decides he has somewhere else to visit. Without much patience, he urges the man to move quickly. Muller rushes over to assist, and Kale immediately notes how Muller seems to have gained weight since they last met. With no time for pleasantries, Kale demands to see the primary external design, snatching the rolled plans from Muller's hands before handing them to the man in charge. Upon unrolling the plans, the man's surprise is clear. He's never seen such a design before. Kale, Ever casual remarks on the sturdiness of the plans, while the man hesitates, concerned about the potential cost, particularly the extravagant golden turtle feature. But for Kale, money is no issue. Muller, filled with excitement, informs them that the secondary internal design is nearly complete. The concept? Defense is the ultimate offense. The man is intrigued, eagerly anticipating the internal design's completion, while Kale muses to himself about the oddity of Muller's approach. He briefly wonders if Muller too is a reincarnated soul like himself, someone with unique insights into warfare. As Kale visualizes the ambitious design of the ship, a small smile creeps onto his face. The thought of a ship like this, brimming with defensive might, appeals to him, but he knows it won't be an easy task. Later, standing by a window, Kale reflects on the challenges ahead. He acknowledges that while their objective isn't the outright destruction of a kingdom, the scale of preparation seems almost excessive, yet given the uncertainty of their enemy's strength, he knows it's wise to be overprepared. The islands between the eastern and western continents have all been explored and numbered, and their destination, Hayes Island 5, looms large in his mind. It is said to be the stronghold of both darkness and the mermaids, a fact provided by Ron's intelligence. Kale's thoughts shift briefly to Ron, an assassin in others' eyes, but a trusted protector to his family. It was Count Deruth's decision to save Ron, valuing loyalty over Ron's dark past. Their immediate goal, however, is Hayes Island 12, the closest waypoint to their final destination. The looming threat of mermaids, now strengthened by the darkness attributes dead mana and poison, weighs on Kale's mind. Others express concern about the mermaids' newfound power, but Rosalind reassures them with her knowledge of treating the poison. Overpowering the dead mana with a stronger force is the key. Kale understands that the true counter to dead mana isn't just attack power, it's life itself. Blood, the essence of life, can repel the darkness for a short time. But of course, using blood carries its own risks, like excessive blood loss, which could lead to death. For beings like vampires and dark elves, who are tied to blood, either by necessity or ability, this is less of a concern. The heart's vitality, flowing through blood, is the strongest weapon against the dead. As he contemplates, Kale knows he needs to test his own blood to see how effective it will be against the darkness. His regenerative ability means his blood is continuously produced, offering an endless supply, but only time will tell if his own blood, with its connection to life, will prove to be the answer they need. Kale contemplates using his blood, but the dragon immediately shoots down the idea finding it reckless for someone in Kale's condition. An and Han chime in, expressing their concerns, and even Rosalind insists there's no need for such extreme measures. K 
Kale clears his throat, assuring them that he wasn't seriously considering it, just thinking out loud. Internally, he can't help but wonder why he would sacrifice his precious blood when there are surely other solutions available. As he gets up to leave, Rayon and On offer to keep an eye on things, leaving Kale with the impression that nobody truly trusts them. Deciding his next move, he recalls a promise made by Witaira, who had given him a pouch, saying they would always help when needed. He heads to Vin's cliff, where Ran excitedly announces the arrival of the whales. Rosalind is shocked as the massive creatures approach, and Pathan greets Kale warmly, curious about why he had summoned them. He explains the situation with the mermaids, mentioning that one of his subordinates was injured by the mermaid's poison while gathering critical information. When Pathan asks why Kale had looked into it, he admits it had been on his mind for a while. The mermaids hadn't used the Forest of Darkness, but Kale felt compelled to help in some way since they weren't strangers. Pathan, deeply grateful, reflects on how Kale had once saved his life and is now looking into the mermaids on his behalf, leaving Rosalind and Choi Han surprised when had Kale saved Pathan. Kale notes that treating mermaid poison would require a corpse, prompting Pathan to volunteer to help, even though he admits he's too weak to join in the fight. He just wants to be useful, though Kale privately muses that Pathan will likely attack once and then retreat. As he gazes at Kale, Rayon becomes protective, questioning the young whale's attention. Pathan, flustered, brushes it off, while Rayon asserts his authority, insisting he'll go along as well. With their decision made, the group prepares to set off. Kale remarks on how long it's been, and Rayon confirms if they're really going to ride a killer whale. He confirms, and Rayon points out that a killer whale is much smaller than a humpback whale, wondering if it'll be uncomfortable. At this, the whale commander protests, but Kale, placing a hand on his shoulder, calmly assures him that he'll be riding along regardless.